Uh, welcome to the 2018 Board of Directors Meet the Candidate session. Thank you guys for joining us here today. Um, today's session is designed to give the members of the House of Delegates an opportunity to learn more about the nominated candidates for the Board of Directors. My name is CJ Fiala. In addition to being one of the athlete reps on this year's nominating committee, I'm a longtime national athlete rep here at USA Swimming, and I'll be serving as your moderator, per se, for this afternoon. This year's election for the Board of Directors is unlike any other. Last year, this House of Delegates approved a substantial change, slate of changes that will affect the Board's role, composition, and structure for years to come. Upon its original founding, the Board was structured to assist a young organization with a small staff, but over the years, USA Swimming has developed and grown into the most successful national governing body in the United States. That being said, the new board will transition from being an operationally focused board to becoming a board that is focused on strategic direction and future of USA Swimming. Let me be frank, this is no small change. We are moving from a 35-person board to a 15-person board. We are moving from being focused on everyday operations to being focused on five and 10-year plans for our organization. This is not a small step for our beloved organization, but a large one, and one that will allow USA Swimming to not only sustain its success as the top performing NGB, but will create a more prosperous, safer, and improved future for the sport of swimming, both domestic and abroad. Today you will have the opportunity to hear from 15 of our vetted and nominated candidates as selected by the nominating committee. Each of the candidates have been thoroughly assessed and interviewed by the nominating committee to ensure, for their, ensure that they are qualified for their position and that they would each bring unique and beneficial insights and perspectives to the board. So before we introduce our nominated candidates uh, and begin our session for today, I would like to invite Clark Hammond, the chair of the nominating committee, to the stage for some brief remarks. iPads are great until you have to actually have them work for you up here. First, thank you, thank you for coming today. This is a very important day in our organization. Um, these 15, along with 56 other individuals, submitted applications to be considered to sit on your board of directors. Every one of those 56 should be commended for their willingness to step forward in an effort to lead our organization into the future. Um, some of those people are amongst us today, and I look forward for the ways and the roles that they're going to have in our organization going forward. For none of those 56 are people that you wouldn't want working for this organization and for its success. Um, I would like to ask my committee to stand if they're in the House, just so you can acknowledge who was on the nominating committee uh, this year. If you'll please stand. As CJ said, the goal of this year was to move from an operational focus board to a governance board. And some of the things that we were tasked to look for in people were different than what in the past has been a criteria for this particular position. Of course, we wanted to have people that had a connection to our sport, but more importantly, we wanted to have people who had governance experience, knowledge and skills in policy making, legal and fiduciary duties, we also wanted people that had high level experience with either their business or a boardroom where you're, they were overseeing multi-million dollar endeavors. We also wanted to have people with fina financial literacy, people who could read our financial statements, ask probing questions, develop budgets, and oversight of our financial resources. We also wanted to make sure these people could participate with others to work through difficult issues, questions, problems, etc so that they would reach a unified decision um, and one that wasn't just agenda focused on individual uh, person's um, agenda in a matter. And lastly, the group wanted to have outside influence that could be brought to bear within our organization. As you look at the qualifications of the people that are sitting before you, 
all of them have something that they can bring to our organization to make it better or to give us other avenues um, into the uh, United States and elsewhere as far as our penetration. Um, everybody has read the guide. If you have, you've seen what our, our charge was. The process was completely confidential. Um, we never had an issue of anyone calling me and saying, by the way, I heard, not once during the entire process. Um, we were asked to get the most committed, strongest candidates on the, on the policies and on the criteria I just mentioned to you. Um, just briefly what we did, we took 56 applications. Every member of the nine member committee read those applications, decided how they wanted to um, rank them in their own mind, and we got together and discussed every single one. And after we got done discussing, we then chose the ones that we felt were appropriate to move forward for a first interview. And in that process, we had to develop standardized questions that we used so that we would make sure that we were getting some collection of responses that we could compare. And after those interviews were done, we captured the notes of the interviewees, um, and we then shared it with the rest of the committee who read all of those notes and all of those comments. We got together again every Tuesday night, by the way. I don't know what to do with Tuesday night anymore because it was many Tuesday nights in a row that we got together. And we talked about every single person that was given a first interview. And from there, we chose who we should advance further. And the same process with different questions were asked to each uh, potential candidate nominee with different interviewees. We didn't want somebody to be interviewed by the same person again, so we switched up to make sure they weren't. And ultimately, we came down to a list of people we felt we were comfortable with moving forward for you to consider. And we stopped. And we took a week, and I asked everyone to go back and make sure that they didn't feel like there was someone either that we left out or something that we missed or something we needed to consider, and we got together for our last Tuesday. And on that last Tuesday, we confirmed our group that we were gonna put forward as your nominees who are sitting before you today, and we agreed that that should be uh, the group that you should consider this year. So I wanna thank you for the opportunity of serving. I want you to know that uh, these people that sit before you have um, great qualifications, I think that will give great service and value uh, to our organization, and I thank you for being here. All right, uh, thank you very much, Clark, and thank you to the rest of the nominating committee, my fellow members, uh, for the months of hard work uh, going into this. Um, so before we begin, begin today's session, I want to give you an overview of how this is going to go and how it's going to take place. We've prepared a line of questioning that has been designed to help you, the voting members of the House of delegates acquire more knowledge about the nominated candidates. This is intended to inform you of their unique characteristics, experiences, and abilities as potential board members, and also give you and also give the vetted nominees an opportunity to share with you firsthand what would make them good qualified candidates to help lead our organization. As explained in the election guide uh, that you should have received at the convention check-in, uh, there also are there should be additional copies in the back. Um, if not, we will make sure that that happens. Um, uh, make sure you use that. The USA Swimming website also has short videos about each one of our nominees' backgrounds and stances on important topics. And if you've not had a chance to do so, um, I do encourage you to take some time tonight, um, take some time tomorrow morning before the House of Delegates to, to go through and watch those. Again, our purpose for this session is to help you get to know each one of the candidates prior to our elections uh, tomorrow at the House of Delegates. Um, again, for more information, make sure you look at that election guide. Um, and also, a big thank you to Bill Charney and the USA Swimming staff for, for putting that together. All right, so what we came here for, let's get this thing started. Um, I'd like to start by introducing you guys to each of our uh, nominated candidates here. Um, and we're going to go kind of down the line here. So uh, from Annapolis, Maryland, Mr. Ab Crawl. From Beverly Hills, California, Carolyn Conrad. From Manhattan Beach, California, Christopher Brereton. From Colts Neck, New Jersey, Jacqueline Hoagland. From Beaver Creek, Ohio, Jeanette Sko. From Columbus, Ohio, Will Endest. From Cranberry, New Jersey, Susan Teeter. 
From Kansas City, Missouri, Amy Hoppenrath. From Orlando, Florida, Bob Vincent. From Greenville, Delaware, Cecil Gordon. From Knoxville, Tennessee, Derek Paul. I'm gonna pronounce your hometown wrong, Ellen. Um, from Igemsville, definitely not right. Maryland, Ellen Colkid. Very close, yeah, I'll take that. Uh, from Charlotte, North Carolina, Jay Thomas. From San Antonio, Texas, Robert Marbert Jr. And from Silver Spring, Maryland, Mr. Tom Ugast. How about a round of applause for our nominated candidates? Well, thank you all for joining me here today. I'm looking forward uh, to this afternoon's session and getting to learn more about each of you. We do have a couple microphones up, up here, and we just ask that you circulate them around as your question comes uh, to you. Um, you will have one minute to one and a half minutes to respond to each of the questions. Due to time constraints, um, I do ask that you uh, stick to that one to one and a half minutes. I do have a stopwatch. I'm not afraid to use it. And as we discussed before, they will get 10 second warnings. So uh, we'll, we'll try and keep everybody here to, to get to meetings on time. Um, all right, so, so with that being said, I, I, let's get this thing started. I want to start uh, with Jacqueline Hoagland. Um, Jackie, during the interview process, you were very candid about the impact that swimming has had on your life. Um, you talked about the relationships you've made, the work ethic that you developed, and the values and principles as which you live uh, have come from, mostly have come from swimming. Uh, so what should be the core values of, that drive our board of directors' de decision-making process? Uh, well, I'm a policy wonk, so the board should be setting policy, uh, and I feel strongly about safe sport, I feel strongly about diversity, I feel strongly about um, teaching everybody how to swim. It really bothers me that it should be like reading in school, in my opinion. It's absolutely a way to get healthier and safer, and yet we had the presidential fitness thing when I was growing up and we taught everybody, which is great, you know, sit-ups, push-ups, chin-ups. can't save yourself with a chin-up. You can save yourself if you can swim. So I'm the little every person. I'm a former swimmer. Well, you're always a swimmer. Former swim coach, swim mom. So I think about the members. I think about the coaches because I relate. I think about all those kids. I love our Olympians and our national team, but I'm the little every person. So that's what I think we should focus on. Um, I hope that's not too general, but that's where I'm at. No, thank you, Jackie. I, I appreciate that. Uh, next question, I want to go down to Chris here. Uh, Chris, you have an extensive and prominent background uh, in the entertainment and media industry. Um, plus, you've worked with uh, many renowned and high-profile companies during your professional career. Um, what benefits would your experience in that space and, or, excuse me, let me rephrase that. What benefit would your experience in that space and your connections bring to the USA Swimming Board of Directors? Thank you. Uh, so my career has is, is really spanned the last 20 years. The first 20-ish of so was I was an entertainment media sports lawyer, represented companies all over the world. My biggest sports client was the International Olympic Committee. And during that tenure, I advised them as their primary U.S. outside counsel on everything they did from a media and a sponsorship and an event and a U.S. relations perspective. And so during that process, I really got to know the Olympic movement, the different pieces, the constituent NGBs and, and uh, NOCs and how they all fit together and how they interplayed. And I think that's a perspective that I have that's really unique because I understand how things work at a macro level. And I hope I can bring that to the table to bring things down and to, to raise our sport up and to, make, to have its rightful place as really one of the, the premier NGBs in all of the world. And so that's the perspective I bring from that perspective, CJ. Right now, I run a motion picture studio. And, and in that regard, I have to bring people together to think about what is important to our constituent consumers. How do we deliver them the content they want? How do we make the James Bond movies better? And, and reimagining everything that we're doing and I think a little bit of what I've been asked to do if I do am lucky enough to join the board is to help do that here. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. Um, next, we're going to go over here to, to Mr. Bob Vincent. Bob, you're a longtime volunteer with USA Swimming, and you currently serve as the vice chair of finance. With the recent announcement of the upcoming retirement of USA Swimming's longtime CFO, Jim Harvey, um, how, would you can, how would your continued participation on the board specifically benefit USA Swimming during this key personnel transition? Thanks, CJ. Uh, you know, we've been very fortunate for the past 17 years to have what I think is one of the best CFOs in the, in the business and certainly in the not-for-profit business. Uh, I've enjoyed the last two years. I've, I've spent 
a lot of time hand in hand with Jim working uh, with the financials. And while I wouldn't say they're complicated, I would say they're pretty complex. Uh, the, the job of the staff will be to, to hire the new CFO, but I would like the opportunity to be in some type of position where I could help with that transition uh, as we bring the new CFO in. Fantastic. Thank you, Bob. Um, right over to your right, uh, we're going to go to Amy here. Amy, as a zone director and member of the current board, uh, you were not shy last, last year's convention about sharing your passion for these proposed board ch uh, changes in structure and per purpose. Excuse me. Why the passion? Why, why the, the, the feeling that this is a great change for our sport? You know, this change isn't about me. It's not about the past board. It's not about the future board. Bottom line is it's about our athletes. It's about the future of our sport. And it's been really cool as a parent to watch a lot of our athletes grow up into really incredible people, both in and out of the pool, to walk alongside some of the athletes who've been on the board last year. Gosh, they're incredible, smart people. And I sit back and I think, what would their lives have been like without swimming? Who would they have been? And it's what makes us a great sport. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I could not agree more with that last part of that, that statement there. Um, over to a fellow uh, member of the board of directors, uh, Mr. Derek Paul. Derek, you're in a unique position here um, in this election process as you're running as an at-large candidate, um, but you're also a member of the athletes delegation here at convention. So my question to you is, how would you hope your perspective as an athlete, as well as an at-large member, affect positive change while on the board? Thanks, CJ. Um, <clears throat> I think that my perspective is somewhat unique. Uh, I think we're also going to have an announcement of three other people that have a pretty unique and, and excellent background in that similar perspective. But uh, growing up in, in the sport, uh, I finished my career in 2012 and made a call to my coach and said, hey, how can I give back? He suggested I come, came here, and I'm very glad that I did. I think that the five years, about five or six years uh, between then and now, has really allowed me to interact with literally hundreds of other athletes across the nation. Uh, and I've really tried to take both my perspective um, personally and my experience as an athlete and make sure that I'm hearing from all of our athletes and make sure I'm making those calls and I'm having the one-on-one -on -one conversations with our athletes to really understand what the athlete experience is like across our nation. Uh, certainly what I did in Tennessee and what I did at Indiana is totally different than what happens in California or what happens in Montana, but we all have a shared uh, desire to compete. We all have a shared likening for the sport. And I think that it's that ability to really take a step back and say, uh, this is how I did it, but let me make sure I know how everybody else did it. And obviously you're not gonna be able to reach you know, our, our hundreds of thousands of members, um, but I think that my experience here and working with the Athletes Executive Committee and the Athletes Committee has really broadened my horizon and allows me to bring a pretty unique perspective. Thank you, Derek. Glad we got that first 10 seconds out of the way. Thanks for helping me out there. Um, all right, next I want to go down to, to Will Indest. Uh, Will, you mentioned in your application that you have extensive experience working on a variety of boards, both for-profit and non-for-profit. What has been the key attributes of the successful ones as well as some of the key downfalls. And furthermore, how would you implement those successful ones if on the board of directors of USA Swimming? Thanks. So first of all, I wanna say that you guys have picked a great group and you can't go wrong with any of these people. I'm honored to be up here. Um, I was a venture capitalist. I retired about uh, six months ago when as a venture capitalist I sat on many boards most for-profit, but a lot of non-for-profit as well. And I've been sitting on boards of various sizes and shapes for the last 10 or 15 years. Some of them great, some of them dysfunctional. And the dysfunctional ones usually centered around lack of communication, as you'd expect. So frankly, I was part of some of those dysfunctional board and part of the dysfunction and learned over the years how to become part of a collaborative environment. So I think the key parts of a really good working board is the ability to work together and come to compromise and to communicate. Being on a board like this is an honor, but being on a board like this is a lot of hard work. 
The hard work happens not at the board meetings. It happens at 10 o'clock at night when you're trying to read the report or get ready for the next meeting or work on the next committee. Part of the, um, um, what I learned through formal training and informal training is, is that the right way to participate on a board, particularly one that's trying to look at as a strategic board, not an operational one, is my mantra, which is nose in, fingers out. So keep track of what's going on, but generally look down the road and look for what's going to happen in the next 10 years. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Will. I'm going to go right here next to me to, to Tom Ugast. And, and Tom, this question did come from some of our delegates um, in, in a similar fashion. Um, so you come to, the, to this election process in a unique position uh, as an owner and operator of a, a USA Swimming Registered Club. What should the boards and organizations' priorities be with regarding to empowering our clubs across the country? Thanks, CJ. Thank you all for coming. It's great to see so many athletes that just walked in after their election and be part of this process. I think the main thing is we have to make sure we continue to focus on the development of all of our athletes, starting from swim schools up through developmental programs and into competitive sport. If we don't do that, we can't maintain our, our dominance at the elite level. So this group, all this room, all the officials, all the athletes, all the coaches, that should be our goal. You know, I still remember Chuck's build, promote, and achieve. We still need to keep it simple, look at what we're doing, why we're doing it, and are we helping these athletes reach their highest potential. I, I get the great luxury of working with coaches every day, working with the kids, working with their parents, that we're all on the same page on what we're trying to do. So hopefully you all feel that that experience that I have will help us as a strategic board look into the future and know how to do what we need to do best. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Next up, I want to go over to Cecil Gordon. Cecil, one topic that you stated in the interview process that you were passionate about is diversity in the sport of swimming. You've served as the chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee and have helped in other capacities to increase awareness and affect change throughout your time as a volunteer with USA Swimming. What do you see as the board's role in increasing diversity within our sport? Thanks, CJ. I think the board has to make more of a commitment to diversity at all levels, starting with our organization headquarters in Colorado Springs and extending throughout the entire organization. Diversity is important, not only for the people who are part of the process, but it's a learning experience and a chance for all of us to benefit from other people's perspectives. So to bring people on board who perhaps have been underrepresented in the past, to get a more diverse understanding of how swimming should work and ideas that possibly would work, um, are critical things that we need to do as an organization. Not only for swimming, but throughout the world. You see the world changing on a global level, we have to become more diverse and less isolated. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Cecil. Next up, we're going to go here to, to Robert. Uh, Robert, you served as a member of the United States Olympic Committee Board and were the president of the Olympic Festival back in 1993. With the Summer Olympic Games coming home in 2028, what can USA Swimming's Board of Directors do to take advantage of the great exposure that our organization will get from that event? I can't tell you how important the Olympic exposure is to development, and it's not, I've been hearing a lot of people will, you know, during the last few days will say, well, we need to focus on development, and others will say we need to focus on, on the elite. They're interconnected. If you look at the two bumps, the two years after every Olympic, the highest membership growth goes up in those two years right afterwards. And, and can't, to be real candid, I'm concerned because after London and Beijing, our bumps were about 12.4 for that two-year bump. Last cycle, it was 3.3. .3. And so that exposure at the elite level is critical for the developmental level. And so we need to use, do everything we can to leverage Los Angeles. But we also need to be leveraging that before then in order, because the, the, it's a cycle. I really believe the elite reinforces the development side and the development reinforces the elite. And it's the exposure that you get at the Olympics that gives us that big bounce. Thank you, Robert. 
Next up, we're going to go right to your right here as you hand the mic to, to Jay Thomas. Jay, you have a long tenured history as a volunteer leader in this organization. You've chaired the Rules and Regulations Committee, you've been the Southern Zone Director, and the list goes on. Um, how would your extensive experience on the, I'll call it dry side of the sport, impact your role on a, on a board as it changes its purpose from being uh, operationally focused to strategically focused? You know, thanks very much, and thanks very much to the committee. I like to think of myself as a long-term thinker, and some of the, the initiatives that we've gotten involved with, particularly with Safe Sport, when, uh, during the, the V3 report review, were long-term in nature. We had to prioritize um, the, the 36 uh, items that they, they thought we were de deficient and could improve on. Um, so I like to think I'm a, of a forward thinker and a strategic thinker. Um, I've seen the board when it was an operational board. I've seen USA Swimming as an operational committee uh, driven. And um, I, I think this move towards strategic long-term thinking is real positive. Thank you, Jay. We're going to go down to the end here to, to Ab. Uh, Ab, you're well experienced uh, in systems and strategic consulting and have served on numerous boards of directors ranging from budgets of six digits to over $100 million. How important do you think this governance restructuring is and what will it take for the board to successfully transition, similarly to Jay's question, from being operationally focused to strategic focused based on your experience? Thanks, CJ. Um, I think it's a critical change. And the reason I do is that um, the most successful and courageous organizations change when they're leading. And this organization is leading. There's no doubt about it. But Changing when you can and continuing to lead and move forward is what really marks a differentiator. And we did uh, something very similar at the University of Maryland on a board that I serve on. We went from a 40 plus person board down to a 16 person board, strategically focused. The reason we did it was for long term direction and a clarity of roles between the board and the dean who's basically the CEO. So we could provide strategic direction that mattered and that the CEO, the dean in this case, could then implement those programs and we could work in better coordination with one another. So I think it's a very, very critical change to make. It's going to make the organization much more effective overall. And I think that having the people that are up here on this board and the experiences they can bring uh, is going to be the engine that will make it work. In terms of, of the, uh, the kind of the inner workings and how it will work better, Having that blend of skills from people that have, are involved in swimming, and I've been involved in swimming, but it has not been the core of my work, with those that have, really can provide the perspective across the board that can make decisions better, and then have everybody team together to make sure they get implemented. Thank you, Ab. I, I want to shift the focus to talking a little bit about LSCs, and, and I'm going to go over here to Ellen. Ellen, you served as a volunteer at many levels of our sport, including having been the treasurer and vice chair of finance of an LSC, and your professional life has included serving as the global operations manager for a large management consulting enterprise. In your estimation, how is the role of USA Swimming's board different than the role of an LSC board? So I think part of the role, and by the way, thank you, CJ, and I'd rather be out there playing cornhole with the athletes right now, but... <laughs> I think the role of the board is distinct and different from the board of the LSC in that our role is really to create and align on a vision. So where are we headed? Let's look out the next three, five, ten years. Look at what we need to do to shift the organization so that we can stay competitive. What are the priorities that we need to focus on? And then we need to be able to communicate that effectively to the organization down through the LSCs down to the clubs, and making sure that when that vision and the strategy is developed, that we have a voice throughout the organization in that footprint. Fantastic. Thank you, Ellen. We're going to go back down to the end here. We're going to go to Carolyn Conrad. Carolyn, sponsorship revenue is vital to our organization. While USA Swimming over the years has many great partners like Philip 66, Marriott, and BMW, it is always a top priority to continue to seek opportunities to bring brands and companies into the USA Swimming sponsorship portfolio. Your background in the entertainment industry has brought you connections, knowledge, and experience in working with similar entities. How would you utilize your background and your network to help USA Swimming as a whole? Uh, thanks. Um, uh, 
I work with I work with a lot of celebrities, and so I do I do sponsorship and brand deals quite often. And I think, you know, using those connections, I'm on the phone with these brands all the time, making deals with you know top level talent. So I'm happy. I mean, my Rolodex is open, and I'm thrilled to use it. I also think there's so much celebrity influence and celebrity factor that that's not being utilized. I mean, just telling some of my clients that I was coming here this weekend, I had people saying, oh my gosh, I was a swimmer in high school, or I was a on the swim team growing up, and I love it so much. And I think, you know, really being able to capitalize and utilize that, I mean, you've got like A-level talent. You've got movie stars that would love to go to nationals. I mean, it was in Orange County this year, which is driving distance from LA. I, I'd love to be able to invite them to a swim meet and say, come see it and, and grow the exposure of the sport. Yeah, absolutely. Growth and exposure and the commercial entity of USA Swimming is, is definitely a big one. We're going to go to uh, Susan Tita here. Susan, one area that you're particularly passionate about is women's leadership in and outside the sport of swimming. You found it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, we'll start over. One area you're particularly passionate about um, is women's leadership in and outside the sport of swimming. Uh, you founded the Summit for Empowering Women 21 years ago. You've hosted women's leadership summits for youth athletes on behalf of USA Swimming and have recently uh, formulated a task force of women's coaches from all over the country to discuss how to create positive solutions for getting more women into coaching. As a prospective member of the board, what are your thoughts on how we can increase the number of female coaches that we have in swimming? Well, thank, thank you for asking that, because I always like to talk about that. Um, you know, we're actively working on that very topic right now, and I think that, that the exciting part is I know that Tim is a big supporter of this, and and growing women in coaching is, is going to be as much about growing men in coaching and the collaboration of the two together. And so it, it's not so much one or the other. Uh, I think the key to uh, keeping women in our sport and growing women in our sport is trying to figure out how are we going to share that collaboration of what it takes to keep everybody on the same page. And that's going to have to do with health care, things like maternity leave, leadership summits for men and women that we can really share and collaborate of how to mentor each other in a higher and a better way. And if we can do that, we're all going to stay in the sport. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. Uh, we're going to go to Jeanette here. Uh, Jeanette, in addition to being a competitive swimmer from ages 7 to 21, you just completed 20 years of service as a military officer as both an intelligent officer and attorney in the United States Air Force. Thank you very much for your service. What perspectives from these experiences do you bring that would contribute to the board's aim for being a future-focused strategic leadership team? Good afternoon, and thank you for that. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure to serve my country, and I am very much looking forward to serving USA Swimming. So my, my perspectives are quite different from a lot of the other people up here, but I feel like um, it can be very invigorating for the board. So my perspective in the military, being able to serve on similar committees, but at very high level instances, for example, making policy on detentions in Afghanistan with the four-star general in charge, or even looking at our own transgender policy, things that have a cross-section from one one environment into another. So I feel that I've had a very diverse background in terms of working with different people from different ideas, different backgrounds, different countries, um, being able to have that sort of collaborative and single focused goal in trying to do what's best for the organization. In addition, just my love for swimming, not only as having been a competitor, but also now being a parent of a swimmer, of an age group swimmer. I'm, we're now in our third LSC, and so we've been able to see all of the different positive aspects that swimming can bring from so many different, um, I'm, I'm now in a small Ten LSC, seconds. I was in a large LSC, and so being able to bring that perspective as a swimmer, a swim mom, and a retired military service member, I feel can benefit USA Swimming. Thank you, Jeanette. Appreciate that. We're going to go uh, to Jackie right next to you. Jackie, 
You're a member of your home county's Board of Education, and during the interview process, you talked a little bit about the importance of involvement from local government to support aquatic safety efforts. What do you think USA Swimming's role should be in engaging areas of local and or national government to increase water safety within our country? I think it's... Might need that, we might need the other one. That might be the dead one. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, we got this one back. Hello? Thank you. Um, I go toward government because I, again, it's, first of all, it's nonpartisan. Our sport, I think, alone, really, among sport, all sport, I think, is generally good, but you do swimming, you're only safer and you're only healthier. Virtually, no swimmers, unless they have a sort of shoulder issue predetermined, get hurt or get sick from it. So reaching out to the government for support, it, it, it's a no-brainer to me. Um, presidential Fitness Award. Why aren't we trying to make sure that everybody swims? I was speaking to the individual from Greensboro about the pool, and he told me about a program they have that I know we don't have. I'm from New Jersey. Um, their county supported the construction of that pool by allowing them 1% of um, their taxes from hotels. Brilliant. Um, reaching out to government to try to think about that. It's hard to say no to someone saying to you, I need you, senator, councilman, whomever, councilwoman, to support this. It's nonpartisan. Kids will be safer. It's a no-brainer. And it's a grassroots uh, way to reach our people and then go to development, go to our elite. But we got to start at the beginning. And I say this, this board should be not micromanaged, should be policy-oriented, strategic-oriented. So going forward, find ways to reach out and use people's Rolodexes and tap in. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Yeah, I think we can all agree water safety is obviously a big priority for our organization, and, and big thanks to the USA Swimming Foundation for all the work they, they do to, to assist with that. Uh, we're going to go right to your right here. We're going to go with Chris. Chris, public exposure for our organization, our sport, hits an extreme peak once every four years at the Olympic Games. It's no secret that bringing our sport into American households via digital media is a hot topic amongst our membership. Where do you see the viewership and public recognition of swimming going in the future, and how can USA Swimming continue to grow our viewership interquad? Thanks for that. I, I think that is absolutely right. I mean, one of the things that's astonishing working where I work now, focusing on television ratings, swimming is the highest rated sport in America for seven days every four years, and then 200 weeks go by and it falls to the floor. Right now, given the fact that there are social media and digital platforms all over this country that can appeal to viewers, more niche audiences more than ever before, the Facebooks, the Snapchats of the world are thirsty for content, and they're thirsty for content with people that have an affinity. One of the things that was interesting to me, I was in the cafe just now, and I heard one of the young swimmers explaining what she does to the person at the counter, and she says, I'm a swimmer, but it's more than a sport. And I think people in our sport feel that way. That's why I'm here, it's why we're all here. We love this and we wanna see more of it. We wanna see our athletes. We wanna understand the great stories behind these swimmers and all that they've gone through. And there's absolutely a thirsty audience out there. And we now more than ever before have the, the ability to channel our content and our athletes' stories to make them the stars that they should be across the country and beyond. Yeah, the stories are there, we, we just need to share them, right? So, uh, but then again, easier said than done. So um, next I wanna go here to, to Bob Vincent. Bob. You're a chief executive officer of your, your own very successful company. What experiences and skills that you use as a high-level professional do you think are most important and applicable to the board? Yeah, what skills uh, that you use as a high-level high professional do you think are most important and applicable to the board? Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, I've been very fortunate in my life and, and I have a very successful company and part of the reason that it is successful is I've, I've always had a philosophy you provide people with the tools they need to do the job and then you get out of the way and you let them do the job. But one of the things I really believe in is trust but verify. And I think that's really becoming the new role of this board. And if you look at the, the compliance reports that come in, as opposed to being the old board where we would come in and we would give a report that was already outdated, it was already in the past. Now we're going to be forward thinking, forward looking, and, and by allowing people to do their jobs, it allows us to stay at the 30,000 foot level and look at strategy and how we continue to improve. Thanks, Absolutely. CJ. 
Yeah, thank you, Bob. We're going to go to Amy here. Amy, um, as one of the four board members who assisted staff on the Safe Sport Working Group this year, what would you say is the most important impact of that work? I think one of the most important impacts of what we need to do with Safe Sport is to truly bring it through our culture. Every single one of us in this room needs to have the intestinal fortitude to step up, to look around the pool, to really notice anything that's different. If we see something, we need to say something. We need to speak up. We can't say it's somebody else's problem. And if we do that and we really look at changing our culture, I think our athletes will be safer. Unfortunately, we live in a world where there are really bad people out there. And uh, we need to make sure our athletes are safe. I hope every single one of you go back and talk to your athletes if you're a coach, you talk to your team members, you talk to your athletes, and you tell them if you see something or feel something that makes you feel really icky, talk to somebody. And if you don't have the courage to do it, talk to somebody who will. Thank you, Amy. We're going to go over here to Derek. Derek, you have a prior experience on the board of directors as an athlete member. Can you share with the House uh, what, you, what you would hope to bring to the board um, and, excuse me, I did not read that right. Can you share with the House what you would hope the board can accomplish that would help improve the experience of USA Swimming's athlete members? Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> I think that one of the things is certainly what Amy just talked about. Uh, I think one of the things that we've certainly uh, had to focus on recently because it's been brought to our attention is to reflect on exactly what we're doing to ensure that our athletes are not only having a, a good experience and a competitive experience, but they're having a safe experience. Uh, I think that that's really something that's absolutely primary that we need to focus on. I also think that um, dealing with athletes at all levels, we need to make sure, as uh, some of our other nominees have said, we need to make sure that we're getting athletes into the sport. This really is, in my opinion, one of the best sports that you can do. There's health benefits, but there's also a culture in this room and across this nation that is really, really meaningful. I think our biggest impact is being able to truly coach, instruct, mentor, teach, whatever you want to call it, um, but to produce good, positive citizens of this country. So I think really focusing on those two things uh, is highly important, and I, and I think we need to focus on making sure that um, we're not solely relying on the NCAA, we're not solely relying on LSCs, that we are creating opportunities for our athletes at the highest level to stay in. Um, I believe that there's really something to be said about an athlete staying past 22. There's something to be said. We're seeing competitive success now at older ages, and I think we need to ensure that our younger athletes can see older athletes staying in the sport. And I think that's really important. Absolutely. Thank you, Derek. It's all about the experience, right? And we want to make it great for everybody. Um, we're going to go down to Will here. Will, you have extensive professional experience as a venture capitalist and even founded your own firm several years ago, and therefore you're tasked with evaluating what would make successful businesses. How would your expertise help benefit the business efforts of USA Swimming? The last sentence, how would your expertise help benefit the business efforts of USA Swimming? So every, every company, whether it's a for-profit company or a not-profit company, has to be successful or it dies. And USA Swimming has been incredibly successful growing revenues over the years. $40 million compared to what it was 15 years ago is, is unbelievable if you look at it compared to other non-profits and, and other, other sports in the area. So it, it's pretty common to look at uh, businesses, whether they're for-profit or not-profit, pretty much the same way. You're looking for what are the drivers of revenue, where can you increase efficiencies, where can you um, help the bottom line. Nonprofits have a bottom line, they just don't pay taxes on it, but they do have a bottom line. So as the board moves from um, being operational to being more strategic, I think that the the really important piece of this is, is figuring out how to figure out the long-term goals, identify the right ones, 
And there are techniques to do that and then make it happen. Thank you, Will. We're gonna go down here to, to, to Tom right here. Uh, Tom, in your application, you stated that some of the top priorities for our organization were to, quote, I'm gonna read directly from it, develop our sport across the country and give our age group athletes a chance to always improve in the sport and help create good, well-rounded citizens. Regarding the well-rounded citizens piece, Many, if not everyone who has been involved with swimming understands that it is much more than a sport, and I think we've heard some candidates say that here today. What can the board do to ensure that we are achieving that top priority you stated of helping athletes become well-rounded citizens? Well, I think we have to work with our clubs to, you know, we, we strive in, in Potomac Valley with our academic All-American program that USA Swimming has to make sure most of these athletes <laughs> you know, will not be on a national team, will not be on an international team. They may go on to college um, and hopefully swim there. So our priority has got to be to make sure they're academically sound. And, and as we said before, this, this sport makes you know how to do a timeline. To study when you need to study, train when you need to train. So. As an organization, we need to make sure we give our coaches, our clubs, the opportunity to teach that to these kids. We're teachers first in what we do in helping these young, young athletes learn how to be successful in life. So I think through our programs, and we have to look at them all, how do we help them be stronger academically all the time? And they will succeed in the pool if we help them with that. Thank you, Tom. I'm gonna go right here to Robert. Robert, you have, decor you have a decorated resume that includes having worked in the White House and no doubt have connections in the political sphere on Capitol Hill. Water safety and athlete safety are two topics that have been brought to Washington before in different capacities. So how would you leverage your relationships in our nation's capital to help benefit our organization? I, th I think we're going to have two issues going on. One is what we're trying to push out, what our proactive agenda is. And I also think we need to be really honest that we have an agenda that may be coming back. Because as you approach the Hill, they're going to be asking questions of us. A lot of folks don't understand the U.S. Olympic Committee is one of the few handfuls of nonprofits founded by U.S. Congress. We're a chartered nonprofit of the United States of America, people like the Red Cross, Smithsonian, and such. So about every 25 years, the USOC has had to suffer through Congress going in to the NGBs, into the USOC. 1950, it was the AAU-USOC fight. 78, it was the issue of athlete empowerment. And then in the early 2000s, it was all those series of scandals. And I, what I'm afraid of is some of the safe sport issues that have been mentioned before. What I'm hearing in Congress, people want to talk to us, but it's not about that issue. And so we need to make sure our house is in order as we move forward and proactively push that agenda. Because if we don't do it, if nothing in the last two weeks, last couple of years hasn't taught anybody, we want to be a proactive uh, arbitrator of our future, not having Congress do it on to us. So I think we need to get our house in order as we proactively go out and push uh, safety you know, just, you know, what some of us were at the luncheon today about just drowning, you know, that simple issue of there. But for us to do that, we also got to have our house in order, uh, both the USOC and U.S. Swimming. Absolutely. Thank you, Robert. We're going to go right here to Jay. Jay, outside of your extensive volunteer service with USA Swimming, you served in the military, so thank you for your service with that. You're a commercial air pilot, and now you're an entrepreneur. Um, safe to say a variety of different types of things there. Uh, I'd be interested to hear what are some skills that you learned from each of those and how would you bring those to the board? Thanks very much for that question. Um, in what I'm doing as an entrepreneur, I, I chair a group at a franchise um, of, a, of a thousand locations, a franchise advisory council, and we get together with um, the, the franchisor, the CEO, the president, and we collaborate about 100 hours a year. Half of that is long-term strategic thinking. How do we get from 1,000 to 5,000 locations? How do we grow from a billion in revenue to five billion in revenue? Um, so that, that long-term strategic thinking there um, through my entrepreneurial side. On the military and commercial, again, long-term thinking. We've got, you know, we, we, we have to look forward beyond the next cloud. What's beyond the next cloud? How do we get around that cloud? And I think this organization has got to do that as well. 
Absolutely, thank you. Appreciate that, Jay. We're gonna go down here to Ab. Ab, you mentioned in your application that you have an extensive experience on philanthropic, athletic, and business boards. So I'm curious, what are the key dynamics of a healthy and strong board and executive management relationship? Uh, like Will mentioned earlier, I've been on boards that have been pretty effective and other ones that haven't been so good. Um, and I think one of the key things about making a board executive relationship work is, first of all, understanding the roles and making sure they're clear. T to me, communication is, sets the stage for just about everything. Uh, certainly, in this environment, all the way from the, the board here down to the local clubs, and in the case of the board to CEO first, understanding roles, then communicating objectives, who is responsible for what, and how are we gonna work together. The board itself has to be a very collaborative, highly functioning board that can disagree, but then get on board with a decision. And then the role is to help the CEO to implement the board's vision. To certainly agree, but then provide the tools and support necessary to make sure that gets done. There was a saying at, at my old company that I really liked, it's not how many ideas you have, it's how many ideas you make happen. And so the board really needs to be an idea generator and then facilitator for the CEO and staff to be able to make those things happen. Absolutely, thank you, Ab, appreciate that. We're gonna go over here to Ellen. Ellen, in your professional life, you've done a lot of leadership development work with many mid to large organizations, including some very prominent ones, such as Chevron, Janssen, and the list goes on. How would you use your skills in leadership development to help your fellow members of the board? So, uh, thanks CJ. Um, I've probably worked with um, several of the world's largest uh, companies across the world um, in the last 30 years. And it's given me a deep appreciation for the issues and challenges that the executives and the managers have in leading their company and staying competitive. So when we sit down and we develop a strategy, that's one piece of it. The second piece of it is coaching. So I do a lot of coaching with individuals and teams. And I think that expertise in coaching individuals and teams can help me with the board in terms of what we need to do to continue to work together, how we need to communicate, how we need to listen to the rest of the organization. Because it's one thing for us to establish a strategy but in terms of having the implementation be successful, it's really about how you engage the rest of the organization because without their support, you really can't achieve your strategy. And if you don't have a clear articulation of what your priorities are and the organization doesn't understand what they are, it's very hard to achieve them and be successful. Yep. Thank you, Ellen, appreciate that. We're gonna go down to, to Carolyn on the end here. Carolyn, as you know, this election is the first time that semi-independent individuals will be a part of the board's composition. Given your background as a competitive swimmer and now as an attorney, what do you anticipate will be the value of having semi-independent board members who have not previously served in national leadership capacities at USA Swimming? Um, I think the outside fresh perspective uh, would help. And I think coming from Hollywood and entertainment and media, I have a ton of connections in the celebrity world, in the entertainment and media world, and I think bringing those in and being ready, willing, and able to utilize them, I think will help quite a bit. I think, you know, in, um, so as I mentioned in Hollywood, there's so many people that are connected to, to swimming and the sport, whether it's themselves or their kids, or they had to train for a swimming role in a movie, um, that they would be, uh, they're just underutilized, and I think we could use that. and. For any of the semi-independents, using our connections and, and outside perspective, I think will be really helpful and uh, help grow the sport and keep it fresh and relevant. Yeah, absolutely. Connections and perspective. I couldn't agree more with those. We're going to go over here to Susan. Um, Susan, you're a longtime coach in our sport um, and have helped transform the lives of, of many athletes all over the world. So you understand very first of all what, what coaching can do um, you know, for these young athletes. So my question to you would be, what role can USA Swimming play in enhancing the profession of coaching and continuing to make it a viable professional occupation for young adults? Wow, that's a great question and one I'm pretty passionate about. Uh, you know, I just sat down with a coach last week who told me, and this is a very successful coach and one that's very well respected, and he, he said, you know, I, I haven't drawn a paycheck in three months. 
And, and that's just a crime. And, and as a board, we need to be able to look at what are we doing to help our coaches on every level with every facet of what it takes to have a life so that they can be the best coaches that they can be for our athletes. And so it, it, I think it's a really important piece that we need to be able to look at as a board and really help USA Swimming figure out how are we going to really take some pressures off the everyday life of our coaches so that they can be the cheerleaders and the great role models that we need for our athletes. Absolutely. Thank you. And thanks to, to all the coaches who, who make this sport great. Um, I know I, I personally have benefited from them as well. I want to go now to Jeanette. Um, all of our semi-independents, Jeanette, ha have come from a varying of backgrounds. I want to ask you a similar question um, to what I just asked Carolyn is, what in your opinion do the semi-independents bring to the board um, in terms of the variety of perspectives? Thank you. I very much agree um, with, with what you said in terms of fresh perspectives. And I don't think the point to bring semi-independence in is to just change everything. I think it's to build on what's there. I mean, obviously, USA Swimming is such a powerful organization, and that wasn't by accident. I think there are a lot of great things that we do very well. I just think it's an opportunity to bring in some different thinking styles, some different perspectives. Um, that's always good in every organization, um, to bring in some, some people that maybe have had different experiences, not necessarily better, not necessarily um, more, just, just different. And I think that this organization, like any other, um, definitely deserves that. I think that um, at, at all levels, whether they're athletes, the coaches, um, other governance bodies within USA Swimming, I think that the organization deserves some fresh blood and some new perspective, and I'm excited to contribute to that. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I, how about we give a round of applause for our candidates here real quickly. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. This is embarrassing. That's okay. I'm, we're going to go backwards, and we're going to go back to Cecil I, I've Gordon here. I've never been one to ask for another question. Ah, but. Cecil. Cecil, um, one topic you address in your resume, and you did address this in your interviews as well with the nominating committee, as an area for consideration is the current LSC structure of USA Swimming. So my question be, would, to you would be, what would you prioritize to help improve our current LSC structure of USA Swimming? That's, that's a tough question. Um, you know, it's difficult, I believe, when you have 59 independent organizations functioning under one umbrella. So I think it's incumbent on um, USA Swimming to realize that given those independent thinkers, they still have to be a part of the organization. Um, I think we have to do a better job of outlining the do's and don'ts that we expect those organizations, independent organizations, to bring to the table. I think we have to uphold those rules and those expectations and at the same time, give them some leeway in order to allow them to be independent entities. But going forward, um, it is critical that we understand that we take on as an organization their independent liabilities and the things that they bring to us that we have to be responsible for. As such, they then have to take on the expectations that we have as an organization. Thank you, Cecil. Now time for an apology, or a, a round of applause for everybody. Thank you very much. Cecil, my apologies. All right, at this point, um, what I want to do, we, we've gotten a chance to know these candidates a little bit, and we're sitting at a time period where we're going to have a, a lot of flexibility for you guys to, to meet with them individually. As I addressed early on, the goal of this session was for you guys to get a little bit deeper of an understanding than what you see in a video and what you read in a bio. But what I encourage each and every person to do is take the time to meet with one of these candidates and get to know them a little bit further. So, um, but before we wrap things up and before people go, we have elected some members of the, uh, the board of directors um, already. These are our athlete members. So at this time, I'd like to invite Lucinda McRoberts, the secretary and general counsel of USA Swimming to the stage to make that announcement.
Good afternoon. Thank you. Before announcing the outcome of the election, I would first like to recognize the exceptional pool of candidates that we had for the Board of Directors athletes, which included Nathan Adrian, Natalie Coughlin Hall, Bradley Craig, Maya Dorado, Andrew Gemmel, and Davis Tarwater. Based on the ballots as duly submitted members of the Athletes Committee who are voting members of the House of Delegates, three athlete board members are being elected as followed. Elected to a four-year term, Natalie Coughlin Hall. <laughs> elected to a three-year term, Maya Dorado. Elected to a two-year term, Davis Tarwater. Thank you very much. Congratulations to Natalie, Davis, and Maya. Another quick round of applause for them. All right, as we uh, wrap this thing up here, just a couple quick things. Uh, I want to make sure I read these correctly before uh, we go. Um, Again, big thank you to the nominating committee for all their work and to the staff of USA Swimming for helping put this on. Uh, your hard work is immensely appreciated in this process. Um, and finally, as I mentioned earlier, don't forget to utilize the videos and biographical statements on the website. Use your election guides, use other resources that you can find to help you make your decision when you go to vote tomorrow. This is an enormous beneficial step for our organization. I'm personally very excited uh, for what is to come. Um, this session was scheduled to go until 3.50, but at this time, uh, we are going to allow the candidates to kind of move around the room. I encourage you to, to get to know them a little bit more so you feel confident when you go to vote tomorrow. Um, thank you so much to everybody for coming, and uh, we'll see you at House Delegates later tonight. <laughs>